I was, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let me, uh, let me begin our time together today by first giving all praises and glory to God. And then I want to give honor to uh, the Ancient of Days, the fairest of 10,000, the one who has written in his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Anybody know who I'm talking about? <laughs> and then in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to uh, clap your hands, both as an act of worship and celebration, but let me give you just a little background on why you're, or excuse me, on why you are clapping. I want to first of all thank uh, our administration. I want to thank President Young and Dr. Payne uh, for their leadership and their support in this Black History celebration. I want to thank Dr. Ramirez uh, for his leadership in the initiatives and as our Dean of Diversity. I want to thank the staffs of the Urban Initiatives as well as Student Life who have worked diligently over the last several weeks and a couple of months uh, to dot all of the I's and cross the T's. Uh, to all of our faculty and staff and colleagues, thank you for doing what you do and being who you are. And then to you, the Denver community, for taking time out of your day uh, to be here on this Tuesday. And then last but certainly not least, I want to thank Pastor Katani Gilbert and the RCF family. Thank you for taking time to be here today. Uh, and we've got a few surprises and a few more words for you here in just a moment. Now, as an act of worship and celebration, clap your hands unto the Lord. <laughs> Give me just a moment, uh, if you would, to frame our time together today. Every once in a while, someone in the community or in the church who's heard about uh, my transition or moving into academic ministry, every once in a while somebody will ask me, so what are you teaching? And my response usually is, I'm teaching something in the leadership category, you know, under some title. And then I jokingly tell them, uh, they let me teach the stuff that you cannot prove if it's true or not. Uh, so that's what I'm teaching. Uh, but one of the things I try to say to emerging leaders whenever I have the opportunity is this. Wherever you go to lead, the agenda of the organization did not start when you got there. Something was going on for better or for worse before you arrived. And, uh, and that's my encouragement to them to take your time and understand the landscape and who came before you. Even if it was bad, you've got to understand what and who came before you. So as we gather today to reflect on black history in America and the contributions of blacks in theology and religion, I think about black people who came before me. I think about people like Harriet Tubman, Black Moses, as we affectionately call her, and Frederick Douglass, who helped to lead our people out of chattel slavery. In the academy, I think about people like James Cone and J. D. Otis Roberts, who planted the seeds and paved the way for scholars to come later like Tony Evans and Willie Jennings to be viewed as legitimate in the academy. Make no mistake about it, it was the elbows of people like Cohn and Roberts that created the space for people like Evans and Jennings. Who can forget Dr. Martin Luther King, that great drum major for justice, whose words live on in our hearing today? I think about preachers like E.K. Bailey and Vashti McKenzie and Gardner Taylor and Claudette Copeland. And I say to myself, we are because they were. And hear me, when I say we, I'm not talking about a black we. I'm talking about a black and a white 
and an Asian and a Hispanic, we, because make no mistake about it, to talk about black history is to talk about American history. <laughs> I think about the life and the legacy of Dr. Felix Gilbert, who we'll honor today. <clears throat> and it's on his shoulders that I stand. So today, as we worship God, we remember the lives and the legacy and the contributions of these men and women who make this day possible for all of us. So do me a favor, stand up right where you are, lift your voice and let's sing together what has affectionately come to be known as the Black National Anthem under the leadership of Minister Nathaniel Black. Show him some love as he comes. <laughs> Can we do this as a corporate body? Lift every voice. have come We're going to slow down the third verse.
transforming my life. As I begin to read the Word of God, God began to speak the Word of life to me like never, I never experienced in my life. So when the Lord began to speak to me about service, um, I, I wanted to serve in any capacity. With me not having, you know, higher education, um, you know, uh, I thought that I didn't have much to offer because I didn't have the schooling and the educational training. After going through the program, um, I really know that I have the capacity and ability to learn at a higher level, and you can too. Um, whatever your challenges may be, Denver Seminary has been a great place uh, for me to really start and have a jump start on learning at a higher level. And I'm excited that I have some more tools in my tool belt to share with others about how they can grow spiritually and develop in who God has called them to be. video that you just uh, got an opportunity to witness is uh, by Brother Milton Hope. He's a graduate of the Urban Initiative Lay Ministry Program, and he's a, a student at the Washington, D.C. campus. Um, if you are not familiar with what the Lay Ministry Program is, it is uh, just that. It's a program for laymen and women who know and recognize that they have some calling to ministry but may not have the time or the need to invest at that point in their journey in a full-blown master's degree. And I am uh, very proud, godly proud to say that program was started under the leadership of Dr. Felix Gilbert. <clears throat> so that said, would you give a warm Denver Seminary welcome to the praise team of Restoration Christian Fellowship. Good afternoon, everyone. Amen. Could you all do me a big favor? If you're not already, can you put a smile on your face? Amen. Amen. It's so good to be here with you all. It's such an honor and a privilege to be able to do this and stand here um, in this place at this time. And we are here to sing, but most importantly, we're here to worship. So if you don't mind worshiping the Lord with us, that'll be all right. Amen. Would you put your hands together? This song says that our God reigns. He does, doesn't he? Hallelujah. My God reigns. Our God reigns. My God reigns. Lord, you reign above every name. My God reigns. Power and majesty, dominion of God. 
So many memories, and I just got to warn you, Katani and I already had a sob fest, so I'm pretty sure this is going to happen again. So many memories of Felix in this space, on this platform. Uh, the two words that come to my mind when I think about the experiences, the times together with Felix are irrepressible joy, that million megawatt smile that Felix brought into every conversation that I was a part of. It gave us confidence that we could step into really difficult spaces together, that we could talk about and live into and weep together over hurts that needed to be healed, over bridges that had been broken and needed to be rebuilt. Felix brought into all of these different settings a deep trust in the Lord. When I think of Felix, I think of three different phrases that I was able to share at his memorial. Felix was a joy maker. Now on this stage, he was a joy maker when he brought to us a way of worship, a way of expression, a way of knowing Jesus that for many of us was quite different. Joy making is hard work. And Felix made joy. If you don't think joy making is hard work in a space like this, just try leading worship to a room full of self-conscious white people. It's just, it's hard, hard work. Mm -hmm. Not sure who's laughing the hardest, but let's all laugh together about that. And he did it. We celebrated the Lord together in ways that may have made some of us feel uncomfortable. Those of us who didn't really feel that Afro-Caribbean beat that he brought to our worship. <laughs> but he did it. He brought joy to us as a community. 
And Felix was a peacemaker. If there's any work harder than making joy, it's making peace. We sat together in very difficult conversations where words that hadn't been spoken needed to be spoken and they needed to be listened to, where repentance needed to take place, where confession together was a healing balm. We did that together. Peacemaking is hard work. I've often thought that making peace when there's been division for 400 years and wrongs that haven't yet been righted or even confessed is kind of like walking up a very steep slope on loose gravel. You take a step and what happens? You slide back. You take another step, you slide back. Felix never stopped taking the next step to bring together folks who with their common in confession in Christ had yet to find common ground that needed to be found, to trust one another, to love one another, and for the sake of the gospel to together make Jesus known. He was a joy maker and he was a peacemaker. And as I said he, before, he was a way maker. I'll never forget when we were sitting in my office and we were thinking about how could we or could we possibly come up with a way to provide theological education for folks who perhaps haven't had an opportunity in their own educational journey to believe that something Denver Seminary could offer would be for them. Could we, could we put together a program that would help folks understand just how much potential they had, just how much they could continue to grow and follow God? And at that point, there was no way forward for that. So we talked, and we talked again, and Felix began to find the way forward. And so as we heard on the video today, the way that he began to establish, the way that he put together, the way that in his irrepressible joy, he kept pushing forward is now a way that dozens of men and women have found their voice for the sake of the gospel and found their place in God's ministry. There aren't very many times in our lives when we get to be close to a joy maker or a peacemaker and a way maker and for the privilege of having known and loved Felix Gilbert, I am thankful. And so today we want to honor him. We want to honor his dear wife as well, Katani. So I'm gonna ask Pastor Moreland to come up. Katani, I'm gonna cry again. We have for you some things that perhaps will bring joy. These beautiful flowers, beautiful testimony to your spirit, his spirit together for the sake of the gospel. And then we've put together a book, a book of memories, of notes that folks here in the seminary community have written to you about Felix for you and your family to enjoy together. And then we have had a painting commission that we'd like to reveal today. All of these are all of these are ways for us to say we love you. We love you. We love what you have been in our lives. Our 
Father. May the Lord bless you. Pastor Katani, I'm going to take the liberty to just ask and carve out a moment or two if you wanted to have words. That was an oversight on our part, and you don't have to, but I want to make space for it. Come on, show us some love. First of all, giving glory and honor to our King, our Savior. It is indeed an honor to stand before you all. This place means so much to us. Um, two kids in 1992 packed up our bags and um, relocated to Denver, Colorado because of Denver Seminary. Felix was working with IBM and IBM closed their plant in Tucson, Arizona. And so we looked at all the other locations we would go to and he had such a passion for the word of God. And so he wanted to come to school here. So we packed up our kids who are now, Eddie was in a car seat, Veronica was two, she's now 30, or she's 32 and Eddie's 30. <laughs> and we have grandkids now, uh, but we packed up and took that journey from Tucson to Denver, and on the way, when we were entering Denver, I saw the street Hamden. And I was like, I had studied and looked up Denver Seminary, and I was like, hey, that's the street the seminary's on. It was probably about 12 and midnight or so. So we pulled down, and when the campus was on Hamden, and we got out the car, and we sat there for over an hour, just thankful that uh, we had found our place. Um, he hadn't applied yet. We hadn't, <laughs> hadn't got a home. We were just, you know, just heading to Boulder and thought, you know, let's just stop and just check out the campus. And um, we sat on that campus and he told me, he says, I'm coming here and I'm going to teach you. And he did both those things. And so seminary really means a lot to us. Thank you for just being watching over us, being our, our, our extended family, um, still here from you all. It's not like he's gone, he's still here, his spirit is still here. When I walked into the building, I started laughing because one of the things that he taught first was how to teach white folks to clap on the one and the three. <laughs> and he so enjoyed that, he was so musical and he so enjoyed that, but he really enjoyed teaching. Teaching was his passion. And I was his first student when he first came home. He'd come home and he'd tell me everything he had learned and he was just so passionate. And he began to pour that into our church and that led to the Urban Initiative. So baby, we thank you, we love you, and we honor you. As I, before I introduce our speaker today, uh, let me just real quick, I want to recognize all of our clergy who have come uh, from the community. Pastors, uh, clergy leaders, would you just stand and let us see you and love you? Come on and show some love to our pastors in the community. Amen. So glad to have you. Not too far uh, in the distant future, some historian is going to uh, pen or write an article that's going to contain a list that's going to be titled something like the 50 most notable preachers of the last 50 years. And on that list, undoubtedly, there will be names like Gardner Taylor and E.K. Bailey, and Tony Evans, and Claudette Copeland, and Vashti McKenzie. But let me tell you, that list will be woefully and dreadfully and arguably sinfully incomplete if it does not contain the name of Dr. Ralph Douglas West. 
Dr. West is a Beeson Divinity School graduate with a Doctorate of Ministry degree. He is currently pursuing a PhD at Baylor University. He is an adjunct professor of preaching and leadership, and you can find him often in some of the most notable seminaries and theological institutions uh, in the country. He's the pastor of Brook Hollow Baptist Church in Houston, Texas, a native Houstonian, uh, where for the last 30 plus years, he has had the privilege of pastoring uh, a church that started with 32 families and individuals and has grown to more than 10,000 by God's grace. Now that's all of the official stuff. Let me tell you the unofficial stuff that I love about it. I'll sum it up in one word, authenticity. And whenever I have the privilege of being in his presence, I don't leave his presence feeling like I need to be like him or preach like him. I leave his presence feeling liberated to be a better me. I leave his presence compelled to get into the presence of God and as one person said, get to know myself better so that I could know God better and get to know God better so that I can know myself better. After the next election by Restoration Christian Fellowship, the next voice you'll hear will be that of our speaker today, the Reverend Dr. Ralph Douglas West. Give them all a warm Denver Seminary. <laughs> if we're a little bit emotional and the voice is cracked a little bit I feel a little weepy there but we know where he is amen we can rejoice in that am I right, am I right about that yeah. amen somebody clap your hands and give God glory <laughs> alright there we go we're back now can the worshipers just lift their hands to Jesus Father we worship you
This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Thank you for the invitation to be here, for always being so gracious, Dr. Young, Pastor Gilbert. John, for the invitation to be here on this day at Denver Seminary. I'm delighted to be here. I'm glad to be anywhere. <laughs> it's good after us being forced into hiatus to be in a space where we can see people face to face, to greet one another in God's community of fellowship. I'm delighted to be here. My relationship with Denver Seminary, of course, is attached to Felix Gilbert, invited me to come a few years ago, and a friendship was established, and a light that was put out much too soon. But today, the illumination of his presence is felt and seen by all of us who are here. And so that's my way of saying, not only am I glad to be here, but delighted to have made a friendship and an acquaintance uh, with Felix. We can start over again. That's what I want to read to you this morning from the Gospel of John chapter 5 beginning at verse 1. A scene that takes place by a pool. Allow me to read it. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals 
Now there in Jerusalem near the sheep gate of Pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who had, was there who had been an invalid for 38 years, and when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked, do you want to get well? <laughs> Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me to get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. The day on which this took place was on the Sabbath, and so the Jewish leaders into the man who had been healed. It is the Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up and walk? The man who had been healed had no idea who he was. But Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went on his way and he told the Jewish leaders, I know who it is now. It was Jesus who had made me well. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. There are times when hope and hopelessness meet. Sometimes hope meets hopelessness in the house and escorts it to the door and puts hopelessness out. Sometimes hope wrestles hopelessness to the ground, stands up over it, and cheers victory. Yet there are moments and places where hope and hopelessness come together. Sometimes hope and hopelessness meet in silly ways and other times sacred ways, sometimes in serious ways and sometimes secular ways but they often meet. We've seen this of how hopelessness is met, maybe with some kind of secular hope. I grew up when you actually printed newspapers and they delivered them to your house. <laughs> and you could read them. And that was a column inside the newspaper with Dear Abby. Abby's role was to receive hopeless information, hopefully to encourage, inspire the hopeless in some positive way. A few years ago, Joyce Brown died. She was a syndicated licensed psychologist who would often dole out hope to people who would call her on her station while they were riding around on their cell phone. Now you have all kinds of people who are trying to follow in that role. You see it sometimes in the shows of Tamara Hall, or you see it in Sherry or Jennifer. All of them have the same platform in the sense that they want to use who they are to inspire and hopefully give some kind of hope to those who are hopeless. There are other scenes that are more sacred than the secular, that's more parallel to the scene in John chapter 5. 
of people who have gone to certain places looking for hope in the middle of their hopelessness. In Santa Fe, New Mexico, pilgrims will walk some 10 hours north of the city to, I can't pronounce it, the Sanctuario del Tremira. And there this sacred shrine people will go. And once they arrive there, some will grab dust and put it on their bodies, believing that a divine intervention, some kind of healing will take place because they're looking for hope in hopeless situations. Uh, that's an American illustration of it, but we know people today who are preparing to take the long journey over to Lord's France. When Bernadette, back in the 1850s, had a vision, 17 of them, she believes, of the Virgin Mary, and seeing the Virgin, inspired now three million pilgrims annually to make that journey to go and see that vision just to be in that space looking for hope in hopeless situations you can go on and on with these kinds of experiences in utah the lady who sees saint joseph and people that make their arrival they're on and on people are looking for hope and this morning in this worship, that is the one thing that people are desperately looking for is hope. Hope on multiple levels, political divisions, education disparity, housing depredations, unemployment, violence. Just pick it, whether it's political, national, social, educational, financial, just go down the list. It doesn't take long before you come in contact with somebody who is looking for hope. Well, in John 5, a man had been looking for hope, not for a week, but for 38 years. <laughs> and the scene picks up where Jesus is on his way from Galilee up to Jerusalem to celebrate one of the festivals which by itself is a beautiful place to stop a whole sermon i won't do it could be preached just in verse one when you look at the implications of jesus moving from one place to the next from home to jerusalem amidst thousands of worshipers that are going to celebrate a festival Jesus finds himself in this congregation of people marching to celebrate. The Lamb of God, this, he's already been announced that, who takes away the sins of the world, has barnacled himself to a cottage of people that are walking up to celebrate one of the three festivals. The light of the world assigns himself to give light and darkness to those that are looking for light on life's journey. The very one who had talked to Nicodemus, Nick at night, I like that, <laughs> who had talked to Nicodemus and had given him how his life could start brand new all over again. That very one who met a woman and crossed every barrier possible by race and gender and religiosity and there he finds himself with a group of people walking up to Jerusalem to go celebrate and that's where we find him and just north just at the north gate a sheep gate is a pool a pool a pool that's 220 by 350, a pool, deep enough to swim in, a pool. One of the names, you can dive in it, swim around in it, a pool with five porches and these colonnades. And people gather around these porches and there they are provided with shade against the searing sun that seethes on their backs. 
and they are there, and they are on the pool, by the pool, on the porches, and all kinds of people are there. They are just thrown all over the place. In fact, this is a picture of broken bodies. To get some insight on this, one reverent commentator cites what Dwight Peterson said about this passage at a conference where he was interpreting this passage from an existential point of view as he described the scene. And he used the word paraplegic. He said, I want to wrestle it away from the ancient history and bring it to where we are. But what made his exposition more compelling is that when Peterson was describing it, you see, he himself is a paraplegic. And he's describing it from the wheelchair and say, we often overlook these people when we pass by them. And he began to describe what people in this condition grapple with every single day began to talk about social isolation and their dependence upon the largesse and generosity of the people that would be benevolent enough to give something for them to manage just for the day. And then in very graphic terms, he began to describe hygiene because many people who battle with this, who are, as this text would say, invalid, battle with the inability to control bowels and bladder. And he began to explain that until the audience got a hold to it. They could see exactly what he was getting to, this condition. It was that that Jesus walked on that day. But you don't have to go by Bethesda. You don't have to go that far. I'm sure right here in Denver, there are places where you pass where there are many broken bodies. One of the challenges that we have in theological education is that if you're not careful, you'll think that the whole world lives right on this campus. That this is the entire world until you walk away from here and enter into ministry in a local congregation that's in a community with people and there are broken people all around us and they are broken. They are really, truly broken and need hope but also need healing need wholeness and you don't have to look far far if you don't go find them they'll find you and so it was there that jesus is standing here and looking around and he sees what's taking place and there's a question that's on his lips an obvious question that he wants to ask and it's a question that you have to ask yourself and ask others. Do you want to be well? It was the question on, on the lips of Jesus to put it to a person that was there. Mother Teresa, she was someone that knew about a question like that. She and the Sisters of Charity of how she would say to them, give yourself until you're eaten up. That is, until the poor and the wretched lived out for your benevolence. And so here we see Jesus asking this big question. It's a big question. Do you want to be well? Now see, if you're not careful, you can read this story so often until you say, but that's not my question. I'll get to you in about seven minutes. <laughs> but do you want to be well? So he sees the man, and that, that's the question that's asked. And there's a description in this where several words are used. One word is he's weak, weak, a medical term, which means that this man wasn't born in this condition. This man is someone that people watched over a period of time get weaker and weaker and weaker. The blind was there, which was a regular condition because of the thin, tiny particles of dust 
mixed with the dung of the animals and the wind, taking that dry dung dust and laying it in the eyes of people. And they didn't have the lubricants that we have to wash their eyes out. Blindness was regular. And then there were the lame. These are the people who can't get around. I've seen these people moving about on their hands until their hands are so callous and strong and their arms are strong they can't get around. The blind, the lame, the withered, they, they become the paralyzed. They become the invalid. They're the ones that 38 years. That's a long time. 13,870 sunrises. That, that, that's what that man saw. And then 13,870 sunsets. And then what about 13,870 visits to the pool? And he didn't get that by himself. Somebody had to carry him and get him in position at the pool waiting for the right moment for things to happen and jesus asked him that question do you want to be made well at the point of your hopelessness and that is the question that jesus asked you and it is the question that we ask the people that we teach and who we serve and who we minister to do you want to be made right do you want to start over again at the point of your hopelessness. In the Latin spiritual hopeness, hope, hope is breath. We, we got a new definition by a visual when we watch Air Garner being choked to death on live television. And he said, I can't breathe. That's what hope is. I, if hope is breath. If I can't breathe, I have no hope. The surgeon Richard Lazarus studied 61 patients who would face surgery and in it he said that those that went into surgery with hope typically came out those that had no hope typically did not come out we need hope hope is life hope gives breath yeah those who studied people who have been caught in caves i forget the name but at the university in Brazil, comes up with a study and he points out how people who are in these caves, coal mines, locked, and we saw it when the Chichilean miners were locked there, how they survived off a piece of bread and a can of Coca-Cola. It wasn't the bread and the Coke. It was the hope down in a basin like that. And where there's hope, there is life. There are a lot of people that really need hope. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to start over? Do you want life to begin again for you is the question that Jesus was asking this man. Do you want to start life all over again? And that's a powerful question. And it's a question that needs to be asked and must be asked. And the man looked and said, well, I really do. The problem is, I don't have anybody. He said, Jesus, let me explain to you how this works. <laughs> this is a magical pool. Now I know where I'm preaching and I'm well aware of all the archeology span and I know how to demystify the passage and everything else, but, but I'm not gonna do that. I wanna stay right here with this man because he didn't know about these hermeneutical tools to interpret this passage the way you know how to do it. So let's take him at surface value. That's why we wanna go. But I wanted to say that because I don't want you going back to class at now. I wanna just say this now. I know the two names of Bethesda. I knew all of that. I know, I know the difference between the house of mercy and the, I, I know all about that. Now, all that's out the way, leave that alone. Now, come back with me. So, so do you want to be well? And, and the man says, I need to help you with this. 
the way this pool works is there's going to be a gurgling or there's going to be some kind of stirring or there's going to be some bubbling. And that is the invisible angel stirring the water and whoever gets in first, that's the person who gets healed. And so that's how this works. And so Jesus said, yeah, I know about your hopelessness, but are you willing to move at the moment of your human possibility? Because there are moments that come that don't come all the times. Uh, you have to seize the moment when it comes. That there is a tide in the affairs of men that when taken at the flood leads to fortune. So I want to make sure that you... Remember, you got the blind here. They hear, but they can't get to the pool. And then you have somebody who is immobile. This congregation of catastrophe just running into each other. And Jesus said, I got all of that, but the question is, do you want to be? Be. At the moment. Moments come, you seize those moments of possibility. The angel. The angel has nothing to do with this, but it does bring back to my remembrance something that happened. When I left to go to school, my mother, bless her spirit, she wasn't able to give me anything, literally. Um, but she gave me a song. She gave me a song. And one of the songs she gave me goes this way. All night and all day, the angels keep a watch over me. And, uh, and as a good son, I didn't, I didn't say anything to, you know, disappoint my mother. I just said, thank you. <laughs> Micah T. and I were walking over to the Easy Shop on Simpson Stewart Road, and a young man walked up to me and said to me, that looks like my ring and watch. Well, I grew up in Fifth Ward, so I wasn't moved until he pulled his coat back and I saw in his waistband the butt of a gun. I didn't care where I was from. I said, it, it sure does. It looked just like it. <laughs> in fact, it <laughs> looked just, just like it. And then something happened. That was a stirring of the water. I, 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 I cannot explain it. So I knew that I had a brother that lived there. So I said, my brother must be walking behind. But I turned around with my fatigue and no one was there. But the scene took place and behind in the backdrop were the marriage student apartments. So I knew some student must have stood up on the balcony and when sight seen, this would push the person away. But nobody was on the balcony. I looked at Tig. And Tig looked back at me, and it's the only response I had all night and all day. Angels keep a watch over me. Angels didn't have anything to do with this. And so, but he believed that at the stirring of the water, this would be my moment of possibility to get in to that pool and be made well. But every time the pool was stirred, every time, somebody got in front of me, of him, and Jesus said, that's why I'm asking you, do you want to be well? Because I'm not talking about pools now. I'm talking about a person. I'm not talking about something that's superstitious. I'm talking about the Savior. Now, I want to know, do you want that fractured life of yours to be put back together? People don't know that's what they need, but that's exactly what they need. They try to find it at every talk show host, every self-help book, 
and I'm not thumbed down on any of them. I'm simply saying there's only one. That might be temporary yeah. hope, but I know somebody yeah. that can give you eternal hope. Yeah. I, I saw it reading People's Magazine, and I'm done. Anthony Faisal and Richard Campono. They, they worked as engineers on a, a railroad with a train, a 19-car train in New Jersey. And one drive, a ride, a railway, they're coming through their regular route. They didn't know Christina, and they didn't know her son, Todd. And they didn't know the other son. But that house of Christina's was 50 yards from the railway. And Anthony saw something yellow and blue and green moving in the distance. To his horror, it was what he thought it would be. One of those children were on the track. And so he said, stop the train. If you know anything about railroads and trains, you know normally there is no stopping. And the pulling of the brake and the screeching of the wheels and the cars colliding into each other. Now, this cart would not stop the train soon enough not to take these children out. Anthony then moved on the catwalk in front of the blade of the train and timed it perfectly. He jumps out, he covers the children, the train runs over him, tears his coat, injures one of the sons, but all lives are spared. The, the interviewer wanted to know, what in the world would make you do something like that? He said, well, if I had, their lives would be lost, and my life would never be the same. You looking, but you ain't listening. That, 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 there are moments in life where you do things that are out of the ordinary, not just because of the spag of someone's life, but because if you don't do it, your life will never make sense to you ever again. Some of you enrolled in seminary not even knowing whether you would be accepted or not. And yet, if you had not done it, that this moment you will say, my life would never be the same. That man heard these words, take up your bed and walk. Miracles always happen with participation. Jesus didn't just get the man up. He says, take up your bed and walk. And with some human effort, he said, if you bend over and get the mat, I'll give you the power you need to stand up. And he bends over and gets to Matt. How long it took him to balance his legs? I don't know. How long it took him to get his equilibrium? I don't know. All I know is, is that he said, I picked up my mat and I started walking. And the very thing that I was laying on, depending on, has now become my tool of testimony. And so when Jesus slipped out, that's why I read the last of it. When, I, when he slipped out, the people knew for 38 years he had been coming to that pool. And they said, uh, who did this? Uh, how did you start it? How you start? He said, I don't know. All I know is some man with a Galilean accent from the hood down in Nazareth told me to take up my mat and walk. I don't know who he is and so he did the right thing he went to church and while he was over at the church house Jesus showed up because Jesus will show up at church and 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 he said I see I told you I told you that you'll get healed I told you and the first thing that man did said I got one report I need to make when I got healed I didn't know who it was I was just glad I got healed but now I know his name. I know who he is. 
He's Abraham's seed. Isaac's sacrifice. Jacob's star. I know who he is. He's Samuel's Ebenezer. David's music. Micah's mercy. Hosea's love. I know who he is. He's Isaiah's Prince of Peace. Jeremiah's Palm and Gilead. I know who he is. And if that ain't good enough, just call him Jesus. And he'll make the difference to start your life all over again. What a joy. It just seems befitting to ask the question that was asked in the gospel. Did not our hearts burn within as he opened the word unto us? Come on and give God another hand clap of praise. Man, it feels like I need to extend the invitation and take up an offering <laughs> after preaching like that. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. West. Uh, thank you, RCF, uh, to our faculty and staff and all of our guests. Thank you for uh, taking the time to be here and to celebrate this day uh, with us. Um, I, I want to talk with you for just a, a moment more, and I want to ask you, to do one thing, and I wanna ask you to consider doing another thing. Uh, when you came in, you had some QR codes that were on your seat, little slips of paper. If you would be so gracious as to uh, fill that out, we would love to know that you were here. We'd love to be in touch with you uh, as time rolls on and talk to you about what's going on at the seminary and how we can uh, work together uh, in what God has called us to do for kingdom work. And then secondly, I wanna ask you if you would just uh, take a moment to uh, pray about this next piece. Um, Dr. Gilbert, I was talking with Chris Johnson in advancement, help me, Holy Spirit, and, uh, and he said something that stayed with me. We were talking about Felix Gilbert and we were talking about uh, the things that had been done in, uh, in Urban Initiative. And he said, Dr. Gilbert had a goal to raise a million dollars to educate black students. Uh, he said, but he went to be with Jesus before we had an opportunity to reach that goal. And that still keeps me up at night. And uh, now some weeks later, I say, thank you, Chris, because now it's keeping me up at night. <laughs> But I was listening to Dr. West, and he was talking about uh, making the difference and starting over. And that's what we seek to do here at Denver Seminary, is to equip men and women so that they can make a difference with the power of the gospel and to help people start over. After Felix went to be with Jesus, uh, we named an endowed scholarship after him. In fact, it's called the Dr. Felix Gilbert Endowed Scholarship. Amen, that's a good place to, to clap. But let me give you a better place. Uh, to date, we have raised somewhere in the neighborhood of $300,000. And we are not going to let that dream or that vision that Felix had, we're not going to let it die at least not on my watch, amen? And so I wanna ask you if you would be so kind as to take a moment just there in your seat and pray. And if the Lord would lead you to partner with us in this effort of continuing to provide scholarships uh, for minoritized students in the black community to be educated here at Denver Seminary, would you consider a gift of any amount today? Uh, on your seat, you find another slip. Uh, it's there, and you have options of 
how you want to give. Uh, I like this. They started at $100 when they printed this. Amen. And it goes up to 500 and then 1,000 and then 5,000 and then 10,000. And then they gave you a box that says other. So you do not have to stop at $10,000. Come on and give God a praise for that. He whom the son sets free is free indeed. Amen. You are not bound by this card. But seriously, seriously, just take a moment. Uh, I'm not uh, overly good at this. It's probably one of my fears, by the way. And it's, and it's the fear of most pastors, contrary to popular opinion. Everybody thinks pastors are always asking for money. And the truth is, most of us are afraid to ask for money because we don't know how to do it well. So the only thing I know how to do well is be authentic and say this. We think we're on mission with Jesus in the work that we're doing. And we're asking if you'll help us and go with us. So I want to pray uh, for just a moment, and then I'm going to ask God's blessing over us. Uh, but I want to pray and ask God to, to give you wisdom in this area. Father, we lift this moment before you, uh, not, not as an act of coercion, not as an act of emotionalism, but we come humbly before you, dear God. Father, I don't know what it is that you want to do in this moment or in this season, but we make space for you to prompt our heart and our mind today. And in accordance with how you've blessed us and what you want to accomplish through us today, I pray that you would move upon our hearts to give as you have prospered us so that we may continue the work in this area of your vineyard. In Christ's name we do pray, amen, amen. So if you would just consider that as you leave today, um, Sister LaShonda, would you just stand so they can see you? And Ryan, amen, yeah, show us some love. Ryan Doherty uh, is in the back. Would you just wave your hand, Ryan? LaShonda and Ryan are gonna be in the back uh, and as the Lord has moved you to give, if you would just drop these or give these to Ryan and LaShonda, um, we'll be ever so grateful today. Amen. Did you hear from the Lord today? I trust that you did. As we get ready to leave, we have some refreshments for you uh, in the back room. There is pound cake. There is king cake. There is ooey butter cake. Amen. All of the cakes. Amen. Uh, so stop and grab a slice. Uh, shake Dr. West's hand if you've been blessed by him. Stand on your feet and let me just ask God's uh, blessing over us today. Thank you again. Thank you again. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly and above all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory, majesty, dominion, and power now until we meet again and forever and we all said together amen god bless you go in peace